This is bugging the heck out of me. The camera is just a smidge crooked and I have to fix it. Um, if somebody could give me just a quick thumbs up in the live chat, I'm using the wireless lav today and I'm hoping that's working. Um, but we're gonna hop right in. I have notes for this live, um, which is great. So I'm gonna be referencing those um, quite a bit. There's not really gonna be a whole lot of playing. I will show you some pre-recorded video of myself and I'm sure people are gonna fight me on that. Um, but the reason for that is I didn't get too much of a warm up um, in before this. I did have to work. So you're just gonna take my word for it and trust me. And I think those of you who resonate with my messaging do trust me, obviously, and those who don't, well, time will tell. Um, the big fat disclaimer with doing today's live is that absolutely any of the video clips that I show are strictly used for commentary on the greater genre of guitar and how guitar playing is taught. And it is absolutely never, ever, ever meant to diminish, demean, or make any player that I show feel less than, okay? There are techniques, uh, the way that people are using their hands are not ways that I use my hands and not ways I'm going to train to use my hands ever for the purposes of demonstration. Um, and so I can use video clips that are publicly available listed on the internet for commentary only, okay? Uh, that's the big fat disclaimer. So, um, yeah, if you want to say hello in the chat, looks like Mike is a smidge hot. Um, but yeah, let's hop right in. Um, so over the past week or so, I had one of my videos absolutely blow up, which was awesome. And the video that blew up was how to hold a guitar pick. And people were saying, oh, you know, who are you? Or like, oh, all these people did it wrong then. And, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so today's live is all about cleaning up uh, some of the interpretation of that video so that you can understand um, where I'm coming from and how to apply it um, for yourself. Because ultimately, um, my teaching for guitar is not rooted in um, using skills and abilities that only I can use. So for example, I can bend my thumb back like this, which makes me an amazing candidate for using this type of picking. Not everybody can do that. It's the primary picking motion that Spyroducius uses. And he's a freaking amazing player. He's a great guy. I've done some lessons with him. Um, the reason I choose not to use that is because I didn't want to sit here and relearn this, okay? And we're going to get into arm picking and the differences and, and all of that and when to apply it. Because um, that's really the biggest mistake that the larger guitar guitarosphere is making when it comes to picking instruction is when to use the arm, not if whether or not to use the arm. Um, so I'm trying to create something that's universal, something that everybody can do. And based on the uh, neuroscientists that I've talked to, um, the way in which I'm teaching and building things is a way that everybody can use. So um, now the next big caveat, I have this wonderful book right here. It's called The Art of Piano Playing, A Scientific Approach. And it talks about the history of piano playing, which is beautiful and how the technique evolved from the harpsichord into the uh, modern day piano technique. I'm just gonna listen to myself here. Next. Okay, yeah, sounds great. And one of the things that, uh, one of the other pieces of feedback I got in the video was, well, if you give a student too much technique, they're never gonna become their own player. And yes, that's true. The challenge that we have uh, as teachers is not to um, stifle any individual players uh, natural inclinations and abilities. So, um, but at the same time, if we give a player no instruction, we just say, yeah, go at it, do whatever's natural. Then you're going to get to a point in your technique where you say, oh, I want to play list. And because of the way you've been striking the piano keys or holding the guitar pick or uh, singing with your voice, there's going to be things that you simply just aren't going to be able to do. And you're going to have to rewind and unwind these really nasty habits because in my talks with a neuroscientist, I learned the most amazing thing. And that thing is that whatever, like if I say, okay, here's, uh, you know, there's a timer on my desk, okay? Timer sitting right there. Hey, you should be able to see it. And if I say to my brain, hey, I want to pick up this timer, I don't have to think, okay, stabilize back, uh, flex bicep, turn arm with back, you know, uh, what do they call it? Like the back of my shoulder muscle turn wrist, 
plop hand down. No, it exit, my mind fills in all of those gaps, okay? And that is a great and wonderful thing that our mind does. The caveat to where we don't want to allow our mind to do this is um, when it comes to issue matters of technique because um, what will happen is if you give your mind no parameters, there's a wonderful video out there, it's called, it's by, uh, I think it's B2 Studios and it says, uh, the title of the video is called AI Bowling Techniques. It's informative and a really fun watch. And when he's programming this AI to do bowling techniques, the bowling technique that it comes up with is like, it like jiggles up to the starting line and then it like flicks the bowling ball with its wrist. And you go, wow, that looks stupid, but it's accomplishing the result. And so what most people do when it comes to guitar technique is they go, oh, well, he's playing fast and it sounds fine. Therefore, it's good and it's natural. Um, but the problem is that when they have trained their hands in order to play guitar fast, which is ultimately our goal, um, and we'll talk about why that goal is and why it's important here in a second. Because um, a lot of people were like, oh, playing fast isn't important, and I bet to every single person who said that, you can't play fast. Um, and I'm going to also make another bet that you didn't watch most of the video because the average watch time in the video is only five minutes and the video is 33 minutes long, which gets into another unfortunate reality of uh, YouTube. Um, so the thing is, is when we are establishing technique, we need to define multiple parameters that our technique must meet before we start training the motion. So for example, if we take, again, no mean to diminish a player or something. If we take, for example, uh, Troy's, Troy Grady's videos on Yngwie Malmsteen, the ultimate picking technique that uh, Troy arrives to in his analysis of Yngwie is that Yngwie has his wrist slightly turned down, okay? And there's six motions of the wrist, okay? There's uh, flexion and extension, so up and down. There is adduction and abduction, which is this, and that is separate uh, from uh, rotation. Okay, rotation is the fifth and sixth motion. You could call it whatever way that you want, okay? So the problem is that the muscles that control those movements literally start about here-ish and they wrap kind of around the wrist, okay? They, they don't go in a straight line, so you can't necessarily think of your wrist as just, oh, I'm gonna perform this motion and I'm gonna perform this motion and I'm gonna perform this motion and those have six different muscles associated with it. That's not how the wrist is built. The way that the wrist is built is that there's about, mm, I think, I don't know, four or so muscles that kind of control those, these macro movements, okay? So the ultimate um, thing that, that Troy arrives at is with a hand that is turned out and down like this. And so the fast picking motion comes from not one of those motions, it comes from a combination of flexion extension and it also comes from a combination of rotation which we'll talk talk about uh, Eddie Van Halen in a, in a second okay and the problem that I have with that technique is that when you execute this it turns the pick further down too far down and so what happens is people want to play d playing down is fine and Troy points this out in his own video everything I'm saying right now is commentary not criticism okay the, my problem with that is that it turns the pick too far down. And because it turns the pick too far down, it makes playing upstrokes difficult, okay? So my technique, instead of saying parameter one, play fast, we're saying parameter one, play fast. Parameter two, play with a very flat pick, okay? And if you watch the update video, which is linked, one of the first things I say is that I've moved from generally playing with a more arched thumb to playing with a flatter thumb, okay? And just like I said in the video, this all comes down to, move my footstool here, is what is your approach angle on the guitar? Because if my guitar is on the left leg, that changes the angle of the neck, and that changes, even if my hand stays in the same position, that changes where the pick is meeting. And it's kind of changing the pick angle, unless I'm changing the rest position of my hand, which we'll talk about neutral in a second as well, okay? I haven't even looked at my notes yet. And this is how deep we're going into this. Okay? Um, so the...
So I can play with a very flat picking. And I'm still experimenting a little bit with how I arch my thumb, which is a separate topic. Um, so that's the big problem that I have with over-rotating the wrist. Again, if you just give yourself the parameter, play fast. If you just say, brain, make me play fast, the brain will let you play fast. But you will end up with issues like that, such as over-rotation of the wrist, where you end up with a severe pick angle, and it's going to prevent you from playing down the neck, which is why in my technique, it's pretty easy to do some stri string skipping kind of stuff. Ah, hair's in the way. Okay. The reason I can do that is because when I sussed out all of the individual motions that matter for guitar, okay, I'll get my list out, it's down here. There's a couple of different techniques, okay, when, when it comes to playing guitar. And by the way, this is another big caveat to that video is they go, oh, well, Eddie Van Halen did it wrong or, you know, so-and-so did it wrong. You can't take a guitar player out of context. You can't say, well, just because he plays tremolo this way on eruption, that means, therefore, he plays that way all the time. No, that doesn't mean it at all. It doesn't mean that what Cor how Corey Wong plays is wrong. In fact, if I play funk stuff, I use wrist rotation all day long because that's how that music is played. And, in fact, I even bend my thumb because I can. And that helps me keep a uh, grip on the pick when I'm playing that stuff. Of course, I don't train funk, but I know how to do it. Um, so the first motion that we have, starting from the very tip of our hand, okay, if you pick with your thumb uh, and your finger, that assigns the control of what I, I just call it fine. Like if you work with any pitch uh, modulation type things, um, you have a control called fine, which allows you to adjust your tuning in terms of sense, okay? And so um, the, way that, the way that Sparadusius controls uh, his pick, for example, is with this motion. Now, the tricky thing about this is that every time you do this, you are changing the angle of the pick. And the thing is, if you're playing on a high gain tone, high gain tone it doesn't really matter. You don't hear it. I don't care. He sounds great, okay? For me, in my picking technique, I don't want to ch be changing the pick angle all of the time, okay? I want to minimize that. And so that's why I choose to have my main control with my wrist, okay? So this is for fine control, fine adjustments, okay? That's what I use my fingers for. And that's why I assign that motion there as one of my parameters when building my picking motion. The next one is that with picking, you have wrist um, add and abduction. I, don't, I haven't memorized which way is which yet, but this is wrist add and abduction, which by the way, again, commentary, not criticism. There is somebody at guitar camp who is very well known. All of those players are very well known. And he was like, pick with your wrist. What's that motion called? And I was like, adduction, abduction. I had to tell him what the motions are. So it shows you how I've gone deeper into the physiology and the neuroscience than anybody on the planet who is teaching picking. Nobody has done this. The only guy who's come close, whose work I really respect, is a guy, uh, Anton. Uh, there's a guy who got mentioned to me, Anton, who's freaking amazing. Love it. Um, now, Anton's teaching approach, uh, he has a video where he breaks down a lot of players and like why not to follow them. And, and my goal is not to do that, okay? Um, because the thing is, is, if I tell you everything not to do, if you tell a child who's running into the road, wait, don't go, what happens is, is the child hears, don't go. Or, he, sorry, he, he hears just the word go, and then he keeps going. Versus if you say, stop, um, then they hear the word stop, and they stop, right? So that's why I always give positive instruction for what I want to do, okay? Okay, so next up we have wrist add and abduction, and that is one motion. I don't use this motion for sweeps. The motion I use for sweeps is rotation. And the motion I also use for string selection is rotation. And so you see how I'm building a technique based on the movements of the wrist that don't overlap. Now, the next motion that we have is uh, wrist flexion and extension, okay? And one of the techniques I didn't comment on in the video was, yeah, Anton Oparin. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic guy. Um, now, I'm just going to, uh, let's play 
mm, I need a riff. Let's play Walls of Babylon by Symphony X, okay? <laughs> Let's try again and not have strings in it. Whatever. I told you I didn't get a warm up. Um, and we'll play some pre recorded clips of me working hard. Okay. Now, in that, that's using just, you know, basic wrist up and forth like this. Okay. Now, the problem is what a lot of people will do when they're talking about their picking is they go, um, pick whatever comes natural. And what will come natural to some people is playing with a stiff wrist, okay? They'll say, no, my wrist is relaxed. And then you watch them play and they'll say, and by the way, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of people out there teaching picking. I'm gonna show you one guy exactly what happens. And once I point it out, you're gonna see it in literally every single person who teaches picking. Every single person, except for me, I'm gonna teach you the way to do it right. Okay? is they say play speed bursts. So they put on a metronome. And I've been practicing around here lately, about, about 108 to 112. So they'll go. And so what they'll do is they'll use their wrist picking for the slow stuff. Good. The reason we want to use the wrist is because this is fine, uh, fine motor control. And it also, because we didn't turn the pick so far down, um, we have no compromises, zero compromises at all in terms of string crossing, upstrokes, downstrokes. Zero. None. None whatsoever. And it's fine control. What happens when you get into using the arm for picking is that you lose control. Okay? I'm going to go to the screen now. I'm going to show you a video of a guy who has his, a player, commentary, not criticism, who because I can't do this technique, I'm using this video, um, has his wrist very rotated, and you'll see that when he goes to play fast, he uses his arm, and you will see that the motion, the motion that he uses in order to achieve these fast skill runs is very, very inefficient, and it's very out of control. Okay, let's go to the screen and watch this player, okay? <laughs> wrist is rotated too far. And having your wrist more rotated, more open for strumming, fine. I don't care. It's just strumming. You're, you have zero downsides. Do whatever you want. See, now what's interesting here is he switches to a flatter wrist on the guitar in order to play this section. And then he's open wrist again. Because his wrist is this far open, he's having trouble muting those lower strings. If you listen really closely, you can also hear the desync in his picking too. You see how wide the motion is? Okay, now we're gonna go to some of my playing. Okay, so here's a little bit of this dying soul, which I was doing earlier. When I'm fully warmed up and have gone through things a little bit, watch how little my arm moves. Virtually not at all. Clip, you can go on my Instagram. These are straight off my phone, okay? Right on Instagram, latest clip. This is scales at 168. Scale. Okay, so let me switch back. External cam. Okay, so the stuff that's going on there, got it. The stuff that's going on there is, and let me just make sure sound worked. Yeah, it worked. Yay. Um, so what's going on there is these people who are telling you to pick fast, they tell you to pick with your wrist, and then they tell you to play fast, 
and then they tell you to do speed bursts, and then they pick with their wrist, and then when they go fast, they pick with their arm. And there's a famous player, um, quite a lot of famous players, and if you go watch their YouTube videos on their fastest shred ever and stuff, I literally had my neuroscientist chiropractor friend analyze them. It's content I'm going to be including probably in the members area that's coming out soon, maybe. Um, I don't know where I'm going to put it exactly. But I had him analyze different players, and one of the things that he pointed out to me is I said, so inherently we'll have more control with the wrist than the arm because, the arm, or because, uh, because this is a smaller lever. And he said, yeah, think about a soccer player. And when a soccer player goes to kick a ball, I guess I have to get her down. When a soccer player goes to kick a ball, they'll go back with their arms. They're making this big lever from wherever their finger is, tip of their finger, to their kneecap, okay? And then the final push of that lever is the leg. And the leg is the small movement where all of the energy is. Now the thing is, on guitar, we're working with People are using too much energy in order to get a thing. Um, like I said in the video, the firmness of the pick stroke just comes from how hard you squeeze the pick, which is just the muscle in between the thumb right there. And again, like I said, none of what I'm doing overlaps with sweeping. None of what I'm doing overlaps with picking. Nothing overlaps with fine control in the fingers. Nothing overlaps with string selection. I'm not over-rotating the pick and creating big downsides for upstroke string crossings or downstroke string crossings, whichever it is. Um, so this is where I'm coming from on this video. Um, do we have any questions so far? You can always pop them in the chat. I hope this is making sense to you. It's a whole lot of information um, on this stuff. So let's sum that up. We want to, instead of saying, just do what comes natural in our pick technique, what we want to do is we want to say, what are the motions of the wrist? And how do we assign different techniques we have to do on the guitar to motions on the wrist so that different techniques don't overlap? Because what's going to be very difficult for you, another example that I can't perform because I don't train this way, is if you, like, you'll see people who teach sweeps and they'll teach you to do it with arm extension. Well, if you want to extend your arm, You're using a pretty darn large muscle group to control something that's very small, when instead you can use a smaller muscle group to control a small motion. You're going to have more control. You are. Don't take it from me. Take it from a chiropractor. Take it from a doctor. Take it from an expert neuroscientist, OK? Um, when I mention these people, it's not to be like, ooh, look at me. The reason I mention these people is so that if you want to go and pay $500 for a consult with these people, like I have, or thousands in guitar lessons, thousands and thousands in guitar lessons, this is the answer you're going to get. I'm bringing it to you for free, <laughs> OK? All right. Let's get into actual notes uh, that I had for this. And we'll do some, some speed run stuff. Um, so next up is, why do we want to play fast? Well, it's not just because playing fast is cool, or nah, playing, playing fast lacks soul. If you think about the guitar solo from Still Got the Blues from Gary Moore, what's the most intense part of the solo? If you think about uh, one of my favorite solos, The Glory of the Lord uh, from the Neil Morse Band, um, the, like, or if you think about a lot of John Petrucci solos, they climax in a fast run to the very end. If you think about classical music, if you think about Dirty Loops, Hit Me, that's how the song Hit Me ends. Playing fast is a tool for us to express emotions of overwhelm, elation, uh, just very intense emotions. Think about like a sophisticated orchestral run with a lot of, you know, uh, diminished scale stuff in there. All that stuff sounds very intense, right? And without it, instead of just saying, well, I can't play that way, therefore it's not important, or 
oh, I've heard a lot of people play that way. Cool. It's another tool in the toolbox for you to express yourself. Um, you know, especially if you had like, I don't know, a lot of delay on there or something. Go listen, go listen to those solos. They're awesome. Um, and that is the reason we want to play fast. Um, the next thing I want to address is that there were certain people who said, uh, or there's one guy who said, well, if I, if I extend my finger all the way and do a pick grip, let me get my thing back up. If I extend my finger all the way and then bring my hand around, then I have more leverage. You actually have less leverage uh, when you are fully extending like this. And you'll see this kind of pick grip in jazz for some reason. And I suspect the reason that you see this in jazz is if you watch the whole video of mine that I did, um, I literally took four different guitars and I measured the distance from the body to the height of the lowest string. And what happens on a lot of jazz guitars is that the pickups are so far up that it causes your hand to be in extension in the first place. And if your hand is like this when you're starting to play guitar, it, you can't do wrist adduction and abduction. You can't. You have to do pronation, supination. You can't do it. And so the type of guitar you're playing is going to affect the picking that you develop. And it's also very worth note noting at this moment that just because somebody is famous doesn't mean that their technique is sound. Okay? I'm not going to name any names on that. Um, because the reason that people listen to music is to feel something. And that doesn't make a conversation that we're having right now about technique irrelevant. It's that when we develop our technique, it is often easier for us to intentionally and consistently express what we want to express. So believe me, musicality is not lost on me by no means. And in fact, if you look at most of the solos I've covered on Instagram, they're kind of slower stuff. Um, and, and the reason for that is because I haven't rushed into this and gone, okay, I want to play 200 BPM next week. Instead, I'm saying, how do I develop my technique intentionally? Because if someone, if a middle schooler came up to you and was like, yeah, I want to run in the Olympics tomorrow, you'd say, oh, you're high. But for some reason, in the guitar world, we say, yeah, you can play 200 BPM in a week. No, you freaking can't. And the guys who can legitimately do it with good synchronization and who do it consistently and don't hurt themselves have been training for years and years and years. So, and by no means do I mean to discourage anyone. I just want you to set your expectations accordingly that playing an instrument at a high level is not something you can do in a weekend by forcing yourself through some set of magic notes. It's not about the notes that you play. You can play whatever speed exercises you want all day long. The fact of the matter is that there's paper after paper shows that you have a limited amount of willpower and brain power and the ability to learn and encode new ways of moving your muscles per day. And if you practice 12 hours, it's counterproductive. It's not doing anything for you. It's just making you tired. There's a big law of diminishing returns. If you want a specific paper, the paper is called the art or uh, the role of deliberate practice in the acquisition of expert performance, where they looked at conservatory classical violin players, and the maximum they, uh, amount they found was uh, three hours a day divided into two one and a half hour sessions, which is approximately what I follow. I usually get just a little over two hours in every day after work and all of that. And I usually do about an hour in the morning and then a little over an hour in the evening. And by the way, if you hear someone who's playing, oh, I play six hours, I play eight hours. Well, I would bet you they're not practicing. I would bet you they're playing. And playing is useful. Like, that's very useful. Like when I fly, fly the small engine airplane with my dad, if we're just cruising and I've got it on autopilot, am I building time? Yeah, I'm building time. But am I getting better at running circles and maneuvers? No. So I don't give, pardon my French, but I don't give a shit if somebody's been playing, playing 40 years. If all you've ever done is play the same old tired dead licks over and over again and you're like, ooh, it's my golden days or whatever. Great. This channel is probably not for you. This channel is to get better. <laughs> and getting better takes a lot of effort on the brain. Um, and I'm correlating it, unlike a lot of people, with a lot of scientific papers and, and experts instead of just saying this. Because what's cool about the guitar, I love this. The guitar in this form has only been around, not this form, right? But like the Fender Strat. The uh, modern electric guitar has only been around about 100 years. 
And when you think about a player like uh, Tosin Abasi, or you think about a player like Eddie Van Halen and what they've done and how they forwarded the instrument, is they've literally developed new technique that didn't exist before they were doing it. And you know, I'm sure there's people who know, you know the history of, oh, well, this guy in the 1980s did some weird tapping. Yeah, maybe. But everybody knows Tosin. <laughs> and Tosin's awesome. I've had conversations with him about this. His literal exact words to me at, at uh, JPGU were, dude, you got to come over here. This guy's going forensic on picking. Yeah, I am, because I'm, letting it, I'm developing it as an intentional process instead of just going, ooh, it comes naturally. So now what's cool about the piano is if you read about the history of piano technique, which, by the way, they call this sort of formal instruction pedagogy. Okay? So what we are developing, I believe, is we're in the midst of developing a standardized guitar pedagogy. And there are people in the piano world, I'm friends with experts who teach piano, um, who believe that the piano should be played in a certain way. And there's other people who believe the, uh, the older ways in which piano were taught in around the late 1800s, like by a guy named Depp. Um, and so not striking the very bottom of the key bed, right? And so this, this is the era of guitar that we're in right now, where technique is actively being talked about and developed. It's not a set in stone thing yet. But um, as it's really cool, as piano technique was developed, I have, for my, for my next video on left hand speed, numerous physiological references, numerous, numerous references to physiologists who were correlating how to play piano with muscles and with early neuroscience. And it, it all happens around 1880 to like 1920. And so now I, maybe there's somebody else out there, am translating this into a sensible way for guitar. And I try to do that through YouTube videos that are entertaining and not uh, necessarily overwhelmed. Yeah, we're just at the start with the guitar played with a plectrum or a pick, right? Like, we maybe have 50 years of that, right? What's the, what, what is playing a guitar with a pick going to look like 100 years from now, 200 years from now? Well, it's going to be evolved on the groundwork that we lay down now. And we live in an age, unlike piano players did, where they said, oh, the harpsichord is played with the fingers and don't use the arm. And now we understand that if you do that on the piano, the weight of the piano is too much and you're going to hurt yourself, right? Anyways, we went on a big tangent. Um, okay, yeah, we were talking about this, okay? So the problem that I have with the jazz pick technique is that if you lay your hand out like this, okay, this is neutral. Curved fingers are neutral. Curved is neutral. I can prove that, ready? If I put my finger straight and I go up, I can't go any further up. That must mean that the finger is in extension. I can't go further than this. That means this is not neutral. Okay? Now if I relax it back down and I go all the way down, all the way down means that it's 100% flexed. So if you do what I did in the video, where I say, put your hand flat, turn about 45 degrees, set the pick on there, and then bring it around, this is about as neutral as you can get. And neutral gives us the greatest palette or flexibility to do this, to, to work with for picking. Now let's talk about the wrist for a second as well. Um, now what will happen in a lot of players who develop the over-rotation of the wrist is that they're simply wearing the guitar too low. So what happens when you bring the guitar too low is that the wrist, the pick angle is too far this way. So the, comp so the compensation starts, you can already see I'm doing it, with the wrist in full, um, it's turned this way. And the thing is you don't have very much motion here. To play guitar, you don't need very much motion. But when you start with the motion already turned instead of at neutral, then the only option is for you to turn your wrist out. And then you end up with that style of picking. And so incidentally, so this is a flexed finger, and then you have to have a flexed thumb, and then you have a rotated wrist. It's just about the most disadvantageous guitar position you can get, and it's all fixed by bringing the guitar up from waist level simply up to where can your hand sit neutral? And if you want to play like this and look like a super nerd, I'm going to say it again. One of my teachers in a very high level professional audition was told, lower your strap. Okay? How, you, how it looks when you play guitar matters. Okay? But we can also make that compatible with the picking technique that we consciously develop. 
Okay, and all I'm going to do right now, I don't even have a strap on. Okay, I'm going to grab a capo. Use my capo. I'm just going to put it at 12, okay, just so I don't have to hold this down because I'm not going to get a strap out. Now, what I want you to watch is even when I move the guitar all around, the angle that I've established where my arm meets the guitar stays the exact same, okay? Whether, pretty much whether I'm on my right leg or my left leg or I hold the guitar in the air or anywhere, and that's what allows me to play because I understand the mechanics of this. Because the pivot point is right here on my elbow and can move with the guitar. So we just, we broke, we broke everything for, uh, I, you can't play in different positions with this. Yeah, you absolutely can. It's because it's designed from the ground up. Okay, uh, next up, cons of other techniques, arm is too big, flex fingers, natural, yep, overlap between uh, sweeps. Now another big advantage of the way that, um, yeah, no, tr tr like my whole video on USX DSX, like, yeah, that's like 100% Troy. So if anything, I'm building on what Troy did. Troy's great. Um, I just think that the conclusion he arrived at was based on people who have no understanding of physiology and who aren't going to go back and fix their technique. And it's a, uh, there's a fixation on these players that have been glorified for a long time for a technique and indeed they did forward guitar technique but now there's a new school that's emerging with guys like Baxty and Steven Toronto and Jake Howsam Lowe you know and I've I've done lessons with them um, not Baxty but I don't know if he does lessons um, but yeah all the USX DSX stuff I totally 100% use that um, so now another thing is if you're using the arm motion in order to accomplish your sweeping, um, there's a nice knock-on effect when you use... Oops. When you use wrist rotation in order to accomplish sweeping, it naturally takes care of the pick angle for you on the way up and on the way down. Now what's also cool about this, when you use wrist rotation, that's also the same motion I'm using to, for string selection. And I haven't sat here and practiced a lick, but if you want to do it, you can. And because I've separated those two motions, it's very easy for me to switch from picking or sorry, from sweeping into picking because those motions are on separate aspects of how I move the wrist, okay? I really want to drive that home. It's going to be very useful if you, if you want to develop some kind of thing. Um, yep. Um, cool. Funk demo, yep. I use the wrist for the funk plank, of course. Um, some people said, oh, I still play with Hitchhiker's Thumb. My point with Hitchhiker's Thumb is that, and mentioning that in the video, is that if you flex your thumb like this, um, the whole point is a lot of times you're going to have this backwards pick angle that isn't necessary, number one. Not everybody can do it. Um, the study I referenced in the video was from the 1950s, and it was only around 25% of white people that could do it and 35% of black people. That's, that's the results of the study. I'm not being racist or anything. That's, go look it up. I'm pretty sure I, I linked it or whatever. So the thing is if somebody's out there and they just go, ooh, bend your thumb backwards, and you can't, well, what are you supposed to do with your technique, right? And then when you do do that, it activates this muscle right here. That's tension. That's energy expenditure that you don't need to do. You can just keep your thumb flat. And guess what? Every single person on the planet can keep their thumb flat. All right. Um, yep. Another note about me, which I don't think I've made so apparent on this uh, channel. Um, Uger, can you specify what you mean by directional picking? Um, and we'll go over that. Picking motion for solo, speed versus rhythm. Can't keep switching positions, it's still awkward. We'll go to the comments in just a second. Um, another thing is that I only got my guitar, not this guitar even, I got a really crappy Jackson guitar in 2018, okay? And you've seen how I play now. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a little demo and you can watch how it's 
like 100% wish motion. Okay, now we're going to go to my Instagram and I'm going to show you what happens as I've developed as a player intentionally through taking lessons, through getting guidance from people who are better than me, and then building even more on what I've learned by studying physiology and studying neuroscience. Okay, I'm going to show you and point out to you how I used to pick guitar. And I'm going to show you these things to show you that um, the technique I was using at the time only allowed me to perform at that level, which was not a very good level, um, number one. Uh, and then to show you that when you practice intentionally and not just play guitar, practice is different than playing, um, you can intentionally develop your technique from where you're at to where you want to be. Okay, so let's switch screens. Uh, all right, and this stuff's up on my Instagram. Yeehaw. Okay, so here we are. Go back on Instagram. And we go really low. Okay, uh, here's a really dumb clip, okay? Here's in the middle of practicing speed bursts as they're taught. And while I'm, before I mention that, actually, let me go over with you a better way to do speed bursts, okay? The problem with speed bursts is that most people say one and two and one e and a two e and a. Okay, so it's a doubling. And the big problem when you double is that the technique changes. A lot of people go from one and two and one e and a two e and a. They do what I call the jerk off motion. They start using their arm, and you don't want to do that. Okay, so a better way to do it, I'm going to put this at 100 BPM. Here's my metronome, 100 BPM. Okay. You're going to do sixteenths, and then you're going to go to sextuplets. And when you do this, what you're going to make sure of is that you are not rotating your wrist in order to accomplish your faster playing. I'm not sure, because I haven't talked to a physiologist yet, how, to what degree wrist adduction and abduction, side to side, this one, and rotation are linked. What I'm finding is that um, and I got it from this piano book as well, is the art of speed, according to a physiologist in, in this book, is about the elimination of unnecessary bimotions, which means you're optimizing out movements that you don't need. And so when we used wrist rotation for our primary picking motion, the pick is going away from the string and then back in, and then away and then back in, when all you need to accomplish is going from one side of the string to the other side of the string. And that's it. And that happens through wrist adduction and abduction. Okay, so the better way to do speed bursts is going to be 16th notes and then up to sextuplets because if inst instead of a 50% increase, it's only about a 33% increase. So I'll demo for you. So 100 BPM. So. Okay, so that's, that's, if you're going to do speed bursts, which are a great exercise, do it like that. And it's just like weightlifting. We don't get in the weight room and go, I can press out two more if I sacrifice all of my form. It doesn't matter if you have bad form and you're going to hurt yourself. You might not necessarily hurt yourself, and you probably won't hurt yourself right now when playing guitar. But down the line, you're going to develop a technique that is heavily reliant on inefficient arm picking. Okay, and as I'm developing my technique, which is still in development, which is why I'm not teaching it yet. Um, I do believe that there's a place for arm picking, but I believe that the mistake that other teachers are making is that they rely on arm picking without sufficiently training up the student's wrist first, which takes time. Because the thing is, it's just like a vocal break. If you just go, oh, well, you know, I can only sing up to this note, and then I have to go falsetto, well, guess what? with the right exercises. You can look at Jim, Jamie Vendera's uh, Vocal Academy. It's excellent, excellent teachers. Highly recommend those guys. Um, they, they don't talk about a break at all, basically. And I've sang with their techniques, and it's awesome. Um, 
And so if we can eliminate the break that we have or create a greater degree of overlap and control, if we work up our wrist to let's say, you know, uh, I mean the fastest my teacher demonstrated to me was 150 BPM on just this, which is by the way, fast enough to play the stream of consciousness. So, you know, the dream theater one. Um, 150 BPM on wrist only before using your arm. I'm at like 110. It's going to take me time, but I'm developing with the right technique. And I think you guys are seeing through some of the clips and some of the playing I've done today, the fruits of uh, building your technique. It's very clean. It's very precise. It's very efficient. And I can, you know, eventually do it for a long time. It starts small. Okay. So now I'm going to show you old technique. Okay. So here's shitty old technique with doing speed bursts. Look at how my arm moves. I'm playing. <laughs> All right, here's 110. 110 sex tuplets. Oops, I gotta switch the camera. Okay, here we are. Here's 110 sex tuplets, wrist only. You don't need to move the arm for 106. You can do it with the wrist. All right, um, let's do another clip. Um, I have to dig back in my Facebook videos, actually. And those are pictures from ads and random old stuff. There's one I want to show you in particular on the old guitar. Blah, 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 back when I did health stuff. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, e Here we are, here's a good one. Now it's very interesting in this clip because I'm basically moving a lot with like, I'm using like almost like circular like donut picking and a lot of pronation supination, okay? <laughs> See how I'm like squeezing and pushing and pulling? It's some faster. Yeah. So this is tremolo. And tremolo is a very, very, very appropriate application of arm picking. But tremolo is different than what I call controlled shred, okay? So let's, um, I'm gonna kick on delay because it sounds freaking awesome, and you do tremolo. And by the way, a lot of the, quote, fastest solos actually have tremolo sections. And if you wanna use arm picking, jerk off motion, for uh, tremolo sections and solos, I'm all for it. And the reason is because it actually is pretty energy efficient to do that. Um, and I don't, I don't care if you use arm picking for tremolo sections in solos that don't have string crossing. Keyword, don't have string crossing. I'm going to say it literally three times. Keyword, don't have string crossing. Keyword, don't have string crossing. Keyword, don't have string crossing. Arm pick all you want because you don't, the only thing you need is a reasonable amount of synchronization between jiggling your arm and moving your fingers. But you, you're going to lose that control if you lock up the wrist. And I'll show you a study in a second here on the world's fastest drum, okay? So. Let's decide what pattern I'm playing. And I'll go without delay. Heck, I'll go clean, okay? Ballsy. Let's get a little more volume. That's arm picking. That's arm picking. That's tremolo. It's one string stuff. So you can totally use arm picking all you want. But if you look at what I was doing in the, the Neil Morse song, I was like doing this, I would call it like a chewing motion. <laughs> and so I'm changing the pick angle a bunch. I'm doing all this com compensatory stuff that you just don't need to do. Um, okay, um, I don't know Tom Hess's playing. 
OK, great. Um, so my point, my point that I listed here in my journal is I've only been playing since December 31st, 2018. And I'm playing cleaner and faster with a better technique than quite a few people. I'm not saying I'm, I'm a fully developed professional player. But I have a much more refined technique than a lot of people because of the way I'm thinking about it through a lens of physiology, neuroscience, and also 20 years of classical training. I literally went to a music conservatory. And actually, I have my French horn mouthpiece to demonstrate another example of just do what comes naturally. So a lot of people take a mouthpiece and they'll go, and they'll puff out their cheeks. And they'll go, oh, well, Dizzy Gillespie puffed out his cheeks. Yeah, that's one dude. That's one exception. And there's plenty of exceptions and jazz players, you know, and it, it accomplishes a certain sound and everything like that. Yeah, and I'm sure if you grabbed any, you know, Chris Martin or you grabbed a Tom Hooten or you grab, you know, uh, you know, any of these professional trumpet players, you know, a Ryan Anthony, and you give him a jazz trumpet um, and told him to go work for a week on, hey, get a tone that's, you know, softer, more rounded, I would bet you they could do it. And proper brass technique, just like proper guitar technique, is not probably going to be the first thing that comes to you. So I trained on French horn when I was in conservatory. And the proper way to do it, it's called your armature. It's going to be like this. Right? So it's counterintuitive. Um, yeah, I only have five years on guitar. Um, the bass that I have back there, I've had that since 2016. My, my, I, I did string bass. This was actually the first live that I ever did on YouTube. I started my classical training a little bit on piano. I did like weeks worth of piano lessons. Like I didn't read notes. I just learned fingerings and a little bit of notes on piano. And then we moved and I didn't have music for a year. I didn't have music until sixth grade, 2006. And then I started string bass. And with string bass, you know, oh, the strings are big and heavy. Let me clamp down my hand and wrap my thumb around. That's not how you do string bass. The way you have to do string bass is like this, with a rounded thumb and a rounded position. And so the thing is, is, is this is why I have to do a, um, this is why I have to do a whole video on left hand technique, is because if you want to play, you know, um, like Darkness Machine by, you know, Adagio, and you want to have really freaking fast legato passages, you can do it with no delay. Um, ha, let's try again. Ah, we'll give myself a backing track. We'll see if Logic plays through here. This is fun. This is a really cool solo. I love this solo. Okay. Oh, hey, it does play. Neat. Oh, I think it's just picking up through the mic. So if you want to have really fast legato technique, you can't talk about that. Uh, stop switching. I don't know why it's switching. Bad. Freaking Mac. All right, we're just going to quit out of you. OK, what's going on? Go to OBS. Thank you. OK. So if you want to talk about fast legato technique and your thumb is wrapped around and your fingers are all angled, there's just stuff you're not going to be able to play. It's just, it, you're just not going to be able to play it. And so we have to fix the form, and then we can talk about how to go fast. And by the way, this book, which references stuff back as far as the 1800s before modern neuroscience was even developed, talks about playing in little chunks. You can look up all kinds of stuff that talks about playing in chunks, right? Like I'm not thinking about. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm thinking about one, two, three, four, five, six. Or I'm even trying to think in larger f musical phrases specifically. OK. Um, yeah, so my point with this is I have a ton of experience across multiple instruments with teachers almost my whole life on developing technique. 
on multiple instruments, and a lot of that technique is stuff that is not natural. It's counterintuitive, and you can train it um, specifically. Um, yep, time doesn't equal expertise. I said that. Um, and then we talked about levers. We talked about thumb tension. And um, yeah, I think that covers everything. So it seems like you guys really like this one. Um, if you're a new subscriber, thank you so much. Um, doing this YouTube thing has been super fun. Um, I'm very excited for the next video. Um, you know, I'm a big Linus Tech Tips fan, and I love watching the WAN show like every week. And if uh, you know we can get this cooking like the WAN show, I don't think I'll have 15,000 live viewers ever. Um, you know, but it'd be really special and cool to me to think that people are hanging out here, and you know, this is what they listen to when they, you know, are going to work or whatever, and it's it's chill. You know, I don't want to have to be you know, ooh, look at me, and let me put all these other people down and, you know, add a bunch of sound effects on my videos. That's the unfortunate thing about YouTube is that, that in order to get some degree of attention, you have, you have to vie for it, right? And so I have to really spend quite a lot of time in my video scripts crafting an intro rather than just teaching you guys. Like, if I could just say, like, hey, you know, here's how to hold a guitar pick, do it like this, and not debunk all of the other stuff that's out there and do a, you know, 50-minute live on you know, wrist rotation and the movements of the wrist and, you know, if the guitar is too low and, you know, all this stuff. My point in doing all that is to empower you to um, start to develop your own technique. Of course, you know, just getting it told to you is going to shortcut a lot of stuff. Um, thanks, Matt, Matt Bailey. Okay, let's go over to um, comments. Sorry, you're just going to get side head while I uh, look at this. Um, a lot of people are liking the Flow 2.0 picks that I recommend. These are John Petrucci Flow picks. Um, some people, I think, didn't get to the point in the video. This is a Flow 0.73 pick. And the reason that I recommend those picks is because this is what I call flex pick. And it's going to kind of play with your timing if you have a pick that flexes versus a pick that uh, doesn't flex at all. So my, my purpose in referencing Ingve in that video is like, is it's um, you know to show you that people who play fast like stuff that responds instantly, um, and it's actually funny because when I did the uh, the recent Gent video, <laughs> um, I actually played that little song with a. Uh, with this. So, yeah, I'm not, you know, the, the point with this kind of thing is you need to have a home base with your technique. Uh, you should have a home base with all these things because if you're switching up the variables all the time, um, it's going to be a little more difficult, I think, to make um, quite as much progress. Uh, would be awesome on comment how I map out picking motion for soloing speed versus rhythm. I find I keep having to switch positions and it's still so awkward for me. Mr. AJ, uh, sorry for getting your technique or your question kind of late here in the live. Um, so when it comes to that, the purpose of um, all of the exercises that I do is there's a great uh, maxim, and it's um, unconscious incompetence, which means you don't know that you're not good at something. And then there's conscious incompetence, which means I know what I am not good at. Therefore, you have the power now to work on that thing. And then you have conscious competence, which is what we gain when we work on specific fundamental exercises. And then we move into unconscious competence. And so the way that I structure my uh, pick building practice is I have a very special series of exercises I go through, and I'm still developing at this point. Um, in order to build unconscious competence. I work on it for about 30 minutes a day. Um, I go through this series of exercises, and then I basically completely forget. And I, like, I'll check myself while I'm playing um, through for the day, but the thing is, if I put those really focused, you know, if it's only 10 minutes for you, and you know, maybe it's 20, or maybe you're like me, and you do 30 minutes of masochistic staring at yourself in the mirror to make sure your hand is moving the exact right way, um, then um, it's gonna be, you're going to move that picking stuff that you're doing 
into the realm of unconscious competence and you're going to automatically execute it, right? So when I think about a riff like um, On the Backs of Angels, which is just kind of like one of my go-tos. Um, yep. There's some pieces of that riff that are more like strumming. And then there's some pieces that are more like the down, oh, I need to address down picking, more down picking kind of stuff. And then there's some pieces of that riff that are more this intricate, you know, just back and forth, you know, kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, and so the way in which I'm planning and flowing through all those techniques is, um, actually let me do another example so I can work on Dance of Eternity right now. And there's a spot in Dance of Eternity. There's a spot in Dance of Eternity that goes like this. So it just plays the same notes and then the last four are doubled. And for those last four, because it's just a very quick burst, okay, it's a little tricky to get that 30 second note speed at like, I think it's at like one, 100 to like 110 ish. It's like, it's very fast. Um, so the first question is, what is the musical intent there? The musical intent is not to be sloppy. The musical intent is to be clean. Um, but also, if I just have one string crossing that is, and so that's where you get into planning which direction do I want to do my picking. Like when I was doing the string skipping stuff earlier, that actually ends so that I can cross to a, a downstroke. Downstroke and string skip. And then my next string. So when you're talking about that, somebody might go, oh, well, that means that you can't do it reverse. Yeah. Um, if you chop off a pianist's finger and you say, go play a Franz Liszt, you know, crazy thing. Yeah, it's going to be really hard. <laughs> Could they do it? Yeah, maybe. It's going to be a lot more uncomfortable. I just have to think about it more. And so when it comes to a case like that, um, number one, practice slowly, right? So. And then I actually use just a little bit of finger fine adjustment in there to get that, right? Um, so practice slowly and just practice shifting those gears. It's like, okay, for this set of, you know, 10 notes, I've got to be in this select portion of my technique. And then, you know, maybe I need to make sure that absolutely when I play this solo, I have to hit that with a, with a downstroke. And I'm going to isolate that. And if you need more tips on practice, I go very deep in my live that's um, called How to Practice even if you just have like 30 minutes or something like that. And I go deep into practice techniques. But as a very, very basic review, um, I actually have the scientific study uh, printed off right over there. They took a bunch of professional clarinet players and they found that it, when they made them practice for three minutes, you know, so like I've got, you know, two little things. Um, right, I'll do that for three minutes. A lot of times I'll do it with the speed trainer on Guitar Pro. And then after those three minutes are up, or I'm through my, my speed chunk on Guitar Pro, then I'll go over and I'll practice something else. You know, whatever, right? 
And so I'm keeping my brain highly engaged um, whenever I'm switching between the one excerpt and the other. Because if you just let your brain, oh, I'm going to practice Dance of Eternity for 30 minutes, or I'm going to practice, you know, think about it instead, I'm going to practice measure 70 to 72 for three minutes, and then I'm going to practice measure 50 to 56 for three minutes, and I'm going to switch back and forth between those. That's going to keep your brain engaged at a higher level. And when you do that, you're going to make more progress than somebody whose brain and attention is fatiguing by practicing the same thing for 30 minutes or an hour. Your brain, it's like driving on the road, and your brain's like, bah, we've just been going and looking at straight lines. I'm bored, and I'm not going to work as hard. No, I want to crank that shit into high gear, man. Pay attention. All right, I think we got Mr. AJ. Uh, next question. I tried to learn in the 80s, and it gave up because, yeah, I can imagine, Matthew Bailey. It's, it's really tough. Um, and I, I hope you can find some new life in YouTube and all of this great stuff. Um, what do I think about directional picking? I'm going to Google this real quick. Directional guitar picking. Picking pattern. A guide to proper directional picking. We're going to look at this on mute for a second. I'm just going to watch this guy's hands, and I'm going to break it down. Uh, directional picking. Oh, I think he's talking about economy picking. Um, economy picking is a great technique. It gives a different sound. I believe, um, I know for a fact that Michael Romeo does it and he sounds fantastic. Um, I know Spyroducius is also a big fan. I know lots of people who are big fans. Um, the reason that I'm so devout on alternate picking is because the solos and the sound that I like is aggressive. It's yeah, it's tense. And what's funny to me, and once I point this out, again, you're going to go look at all these promotional materials and you're going to go, Matt was right. Yep, I was right again. A lot of guys who are going, oh, you want to play fast? Check this out. And then they play some riff and there's like, they'll like, you know, play some pentatonic thing and then they'll have like six notes in there, maybe, that are like this. Back. And then they're like back to doing hybrid picking and all this stuff. And it's like, no, 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 no. You misunderstand me, sir. I want to learn how to play this dying soul, which is just. Right? It's just two minutes of just 192 vibrating, right? Um, so you want to pick a teacher who's going to align with being able to teach you that and not like there's no absolutely no way that you're going to play that with hybrid picking it'd be weird um you could play it with economy picking sure it's not going to sound the same um and you can listen to you know any petrucci recording that's been done of it and this and that's a great example of where there's going to be a crossover with wrist picking and arm picking because that piece of music, that unison, is at 192 uh, 16th notes. It goes by so quickly that you kind of need to recruit, in my opinion, a larger muscle group in order to be able to execute it. When I say that, this is not an excuse to, well, he said use a larger muscle group, it's more efficient. No, that's not what it is. Uh, that piece is an exception unless you're looking at like a Spawn of Possession song, which is freaking amazing guitar playing, by the way. It's very, 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 very intense death metal. Um, I was blown away when I watched it, and I do kind of want to work on it one day, not because I'm into crazy screamo demon stuff, um, but just for the sheer technical accomplishment of it. Um, anyways, uh, directional picking, I think it's great. Um, there is it's, it's a totally different skill. And if you want to develop it, go for it. Um, I would recommend probably choosing to work on alternate picking or choosing to work on um, economy picking at one time for a season of your guitar playing. And by season, I mean a period of intense focus lasting probably a minimum of two months and, you know, could be a year or two years. And a specific place where you might choose to use economy picking would be in a solo that, hey, you know what, if I just economy pick this one little spot, cool. 
program your brain to do just the economy picking in just that one spot so you can reset your picking pattern. Now, if you do that, um, just realize that just because you want to program that one little pick stroke in there when you're performing one specific piece of music doesn't mean that you need to throw out all of your uh, alternate picking technique and switch your whole technique just because you have one spot. Like, there's always exceptions to the rule. My point, again, is that you need to have a foundation that you can come back to. Um, and you need to build it so that you're at a, a level of unconscious competence so when you're put under the gun and you've got to perform for people, that's the picking technique that you're going to primarily rely on. And changing that takes a long time. All right. Um, so we got directional picking. Um, musical background, but only five years on guitar. Um, yeah, I started string bass in 2006. I mean, I could whip out Enigma machine for you on the bass, like, right now, pretty much. Uh, I'd have to look at the fugue section <laughs> um, and the, the bass fills. Uh, I tried to throw you a few bucks after watching videos, but hard to figure out how to do so. You don't have to address this right now. But obviously, might something fix later. Do you like the Petrucci Trinity pick too? I'll go back and forth between the flow and the Trinity. If you like the Trinity pick, great. Um, I have a pretty big, I have like a toe thumb. I have a pretty big thumb. Um, and so, we're going to get out a special jar. This is my picks jar. All right. Here's, a, here's my thumb. Here's my thumb. Here's a Jazz 3 pick. Put some white paper behind, behind that. Uh, my thumb basically covers the whole pick. Or here, here's a better way to show it. There we go. My thumb just covers the entire pick. It's just, it's, Jazz 3 is, is great. And Jazz 3, by the way, is a non-flex pick. Doesn't, doesn't flex. I find these prodigy picks, some people in death metal like them. I would also bet a lot of the people who really resonate with these are using a very extreme pick angle. And because they're using an extreme pick angle, the sharp point of this compensates for that. Um, this is another Jazz 3. Um, this is a JP Ultex from JPGU. And this is the same size as, basically the same size as the flow. I know the camera is not necessarily going to focus perfectly, but those are the same size. So I have large thumbs. And because I have large thumbs, I like a larger pick. It doesn't necessarily extend that far. It's more like that. Um, so yeah, I also love, recommend these a lot. Especially when people like they're like, oh, I play on a you know on a this thin pick, right? It's like okay, well, moving from like I had a student, he just moved from, I got him to move from just a flex pick to just the JP 1.5 Jazz 3, which by the way is just a smidge bigger than the normal Jazz 3, just a smidge. Um, and he was like, it just transformed his playing because all of a sudden, the notes were right there. Um, but yeah, if you like the Trinity pick, go for it. Um, the Trinity pick is much larger even than the uh, than the flow pick. I believe this is no, this is a, says Prodigy on there, but I think the Trinities are quite large. Um, oh, this is a Trinity. Sorry, this one says Prodigy, but it's a Trinity. The reason I'm not a big fan of the Trinity is just because I can take these and they're. Um, I know I'm holding it the right way, and I, like. This, I might wear it on this edge, and then this edge, and then this edge. Like, I could figure out where I'm at blind with this, right? I don't know. I, I just like these. If you like the Trinity picks, go for it. My whole point with picks is I recommend using a, a non-flex pick. Um, when I'm playing heavily distorted chords in progressive death metal, I still get a lot of feedback, and I'm proactively muting them. Um, oh, by the way, we'll go over payment stuff because that's coming up with the release of the next video. So if you guys do want to throw money at the screen, which I'd very much appreciate, um, I just want you guys to get something for it. Um, I don't want you to just give me money to give me money, um, which thank you if you want to. Um, keep that one I'm building a little members area 
Um, there's not a specific promise of, oh, I'm going to continually add content. Because the thing is, is it's not about the user gets no additional value when they are overwhelmed with content. There is, however, miscellaneous tips that cannot be easily categorized, number one. And there are pieces of information that don't fit elsewhere inside the context of an entire course. And that is the information that I'm going to be including there. The other information that I'm going to be including in the course area um, is, excuse me, stuff that just won't do well on YouTube. So before I do a YouTube video, um, I always, I have a SEO person I work with and basically there's like, okay, these keywords are good and you know, th this one, you know, we think we'll get a lot of response and here's how to do your video title. Um, and again, that's just stuff you have to do if you want to reach anybody on YouTube. Um, and so, you know, like, I can write a whole video on how to do a volume pedal, you know, with an analog pedal instead of needing to buy, you know, a pedal that is twice as much and marketed to you as a volume pedal. You can do it with an analog pedal, um, and but it doesn't really make sense for me to do that because it's not necessarily going to grow the channel. So whenever I'm looking at a main channel upload, um, I'm always looking for something that has uh, what I call big problem, and then number two, and then. Uh, number two is non-obvious connection. So a uh, big problem would be like how to hold a guitar pick. That's a really big problem. Uh, how to do drop tunings on floating bridge guitars. I don't really expect that video to, you know, lifetime probably hit more than 10K views, if that, right? Um, so I have to be careful on how do I, how do I connect these things and all that. So um, that is coming. Um, I'm still, I just, I got to film everything and then it's got to be ready, but it's built, it's coming. So uh, yeah, if you want to hop in, you're going to learn some stuff uh, that's going to be really fun and cool. Um, and I'm going to shoot it and edit it well and all that. I'm not just going to be like, here's a random Zoom screen recording. I want it to feel premium. So that's coming. Um, okay. Heavily distorted chords. Yes. Uh, let's talk about down picking. Okay. Get back with my thing. All right, so this is very, 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 very important. The thing is, is when you want to play. The first thing I would say to you is um, watch the lead guitar. Uh, sorry, this is for Mayer. Um, watch the lead guitar muting techniques video because that video is focused about how to combine left hand and right hand muting. So for example, when you play a sweep like you don't want to have your left hand fingers so curved and open because if you're going to play A I'm, and I'm just I'm, I'm plucking the A string and everything above it you're going to primarily hear A at the 12th fret, but then I'm going to stop the A and you're going to hear everything ringing out very subtly. That's probably a, maybe a little piece of what you're struggling with. And so the first thing that you can do is um, you don't want to collapse the finger. You don't want to bend your finger like that. You just want to bring it down flatter so that it's covering all of the strings, not with this last segment of the finger really, but basically from you know, where the tip of your finger bends to maybe like the middle of the first joint of the finger. Um, and so you'll see, well, I'm at 12, so it's not going to work well. So all I'm doing is I'm blocking these, these other strings. I'm going to move the camera a little closer. I'll come a little closer. All I'm doing is blocking the other strings by just, let, instead of having my finger, my hand open, get it. Figure it out. <laughs> All right. Instead of having my finger open, I'm just having it down. Open, down. So that's going to be your first thing. The second thing is that um, while generally we don't want to rotate down, when you're talking about repeated heavy, heavy, heavy down picking stuff, a little bit of downward rotation is okay. And I'm going to give you a riff example in a second, but all I'm going to do is just ham on the downstring stuff for a second. I'm going to get in really close. Bear with the awful camera motion. Okay. So really heavy, repeated downstrick stuff. Watch how my wrist goes from flat, shred, 
And you'll notice that I'm finding as I go lower on the string, I tend to use the find control here when I go lower. And I'm fine with that because what's really happening is that instead of my hand, um, by the way, you should watch the seven string, how to play seven string video if you're struggling with this. You're like, oh, well, I'm, I, my hand is all the way extended when I'm on the top string. And it's all the way here, right? The way you control that is with your elbow. And I have an exercise in the, in the how to play seven string guitar video that, that will teach you how to do that movement, OK? But I'm finding for me, for now, I'm using this motion. And it's just allowing me to keep the pick relatively flat. I'm not entering into a crazy new pick angle. I might be. It's something I'm still kind of experimenting with and working on. OK. Um, flattening a lot more, and I'm working on sweeping. Yeah, great. Yeah, watch the, uh, yeah, Mara, watch the, uh, the thing. But anyways, so um, when you're doing this, and I'm playing, I'm playing all three strings. You see how my wrist is naturally coming out and down a little? And so when you're going between those two techniques, one, like if you watch, um, like, Dean Lamb, um, of Arch Spire, um, I watched, I looked up what is the hardest Arch Spire song. And by the way, commentary on general guitar sphere, not criticism. It appears to me in the very limited stuff that I've watched that a lot of Dan's fastest playing is number one, economy picking, sweeping, and tapping, and then tremolo. He's not a super crazy, 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 crazy fast alternate picker. If you watch the somnambulation or whatever it is, he does some high sweepy stuff, and then he does and all of the fast stuff. And by the way, if, if I go, if I play, you'll see this pattern a lot in death metal, by the way, where the guitar is playing, you know, whatever, eighth notes. And then the drums are going like crazy blast, like, Versus if I go your perception of how fast somebody's playing is changed or affected by the drums. So don't mistake fast guitar playing with fast drumming. And in fact, um, you'll see sometimes where the drums are going really fast and the guitar player is just going and all the guitar player is doing is he's just doing like easy strums, okay? Um, so let's go over this. So uh, one of my riffs Ah, how does it go? Yeah, so my guitar teacher, he told me to play it with three downstrokes in a row. And it's at, I think my song is at like 136. So the point is, with downstroke, it's totally cool if you come and you're doing repeated stuff like this. And that is a, a motion that you're going to have to work up similar to the, the speed stuff. And I don't run into it a lot. And so like with my riff, I haven't, I haven't worked on that in months. Um, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily worked up. But you will come maybe out and down a little bit. And then you should be muting kind of from here. And you're going to also need to look for where kind of the dynamics of where your hand ends up on the guitar and where you're muting. Because if, as if you're muting right, you know, kind of here on the hands, but this is too far back, then you're going to end up compensating in some way, right? So make sure your hand is up enough, and then it's totally cool to like come out a little bit. And that's, that's how I'm doing. And so I'm going between those two techniques. So the down picking technique, like this, and then just with the little da 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 da. So I hope that makes sense in terms of um, in terms of going back and forth between the um, the kind of two techniques that you can use for down picking 
and then hopping into the more controlled shred technique is what I'm specifically calling it. OK. Um, I use Dunlop Flow 1.3 picks. What do you think of these picks? Um, as I mean, with picks, it's really a personal preference thing. My, my like only request or recommendation, all I can do at the end of the day, is that it's a non-flex pick. If you, uh, the JPs are 1.5. I think the Jazz is a 1.0. Pretty much anything above 1.0 is not going to flex virtually at all. Um, and for the people who haven't watched the video, I, I uh, suggest or recommend that people who are promoting, oh, this is a 9 millimeter pick and it, it helps with you know, pain. Absolutely, look, if it helps you with pain and you can't play otherwise, please do it. Um, not having your playing ability is everything. Um, my suspicion with those players, though, is thumb extension, which is going to cause probably some pain here or here. A lot of times engagement on the top uh, stuff on the uh, hands. I haven't memorized the names for it. Um, and the thing is, is whether I'm you know squeezing something that's this big or I'm squeezing something that's 0.73 millimeters, my suspicion is that the pain comes from how hard you're squeezing the thing not how thick the thing that you're squeezing is. They're two separate things. All right, um, I started doing flat in that. Uh, so I'm like, uh, yeah. All right, uh, any last questions? Or we'll kind of kind of wrap this one up. Um, any recommendations for videos you guys want to see? I've got a couple planned out. Um, I hope the playing was decent today. It was not, I won't say it's my best playing. I didn't really get to, to warm up. It's always a little spicy uh, doing stuff live. Um, I started working on piano a lot lately, which has been uh, really fun. I'll show you guys some of that. This, consider this the after show, OK? <laughs> this will be fun. All right. We'll put on the. Uh, the RGB lights to do after show. Smooth. You probably won't see it. Hey, there we go. But I have a little RGB strip right up here. <laughs> um, yeah, but I'll show you some piano stuff real quick. Um, I did train classical piano, just basic stuff, uh, while in college. And piano is an instrument I've always really connected with. Um, on an emotional level, and let's see what this one is. Oh, I posted on Facebook, um, so let me grab it. My recording isn't perfect, but my goal with piano is not to be perfect. <laughs> All right, uh, I got PC. Hey, here we go. I'm telling you, all this stuff is just a neuroscience equation. So there's some uh, piano for you guys. Uh, piano is a really fun, beautiful instrument. Uh, quick question when changing chords to source, how do you stop the scratching sound from coming with the strings? Uh, Doratio? Do Dorado? Mr. Garcia? Um, legato video is, we're going to do left hand video, and then we're going to do, I don't really want to call it a legato video, because I don't feel like I'm at where I want to be at for legato. Um, but we're going to do 
left hand form, and then we're going to do left hand speed. Those are the kind of the next two videos on the block. Um, because we got to get the left hand moving and thinking correctly before we can talk about it. Um, when changing chords using distortion, how do you stop the scratching sound from coming from the strings? Um, that's a little hard to diagnose without knowing, like seeing you're playing. Um, one of the things that can make a big difference, I'll grab my guitar again, is how much gain do you have in your sound? Because what a lot of people do, I don't know if it's coming through. Uh, let's see. Right? So I actually do have this particular patch set at 10 for the gain. But I, well, all I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I've got my hand on the gain control for my axe stuff. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slowly roll up that gain. And what you want to do is um, we'll share the screen here. Get this out of the way. Okay. Okay, so all I'm going to do is I'm just going to slowly roll up the gain. Okay? And what you're going to find, kind of generally speaking, is if you're at like, you know, two to four, like zero, you're going to not have really a heavy sound. Right, this is, this is your dad's rock and roll. And this is, you know, that kind of edge breakup tone. Right, now if we get up into like five, now we're getting into, er, I'd say like early metal, right? Right? Actually, five has got great. Now, the tricky part about five with our gain is now let's go into like, I'm going to kick on delay. I'm going to like play some solo stuff. I'm losing a little bit of the sustain that I want to have. You see how when I went for that dive, really tapers off right about there. Right at about, you know, I'm playing C, but right when we get down to like A to A flat, I lose a lot of it. Right there. And so it's like, okay, let's add a little bit more gain in. A little bit more gain. Still not quite enough, right? But now it's here, let's go back to those chords. All right, now let's do our little sustain test. That's actually sounding pretty good. Um, now let's just go, let's go to 10, right? Let's see what 10 sounds like. That's making it a little bit easier, but you might have heard right at the end when I was crossing here to here. Or you heard. So where you set this gain knob is really gonna kind of affect um, where that where you're going to want to set the, or how you're going to kind of want to play the guitar, right? So, like, if we go back to the, the On the Backs of Angels thing, um, sorry, i got to get my view up.
I just stopped. What I did there is I stopped the G and the D, which are the notes I'm supposed to be playing. And there was all this other extra ringing kind of stuff. So, um, so it's also going to come down to how you handle the guitar. And I'd probably point you back to practicing. The next thing is that, like, literally all I'm doing is lifting, right? And if, even if I try to lift straight off the guitar, the strings are still going to ring. And it's just something you have to contend with. Um, and this is a seven string. And like when I got my five string bass, which is the only bass that I have here, um, I remember the advice that I got was, oh, you have to learn how to keep the strings quiet. And um, I will say some people I've talked with will say, like there's a little bit of like a, <laughs> he's using a fret wrap, right? Fret wrap, awesome tool, amazing tool. Please use it to make great art. But at the same time, don't use it as a crutch because you can't learn how to dial in a tone that isn't too high gain and you don't know how to control your strings. Like, you know, so it's, it's going to be a balance of how you play the guitar, um, what the gain is set like, what your chords are set like, all of that. Um, Mr. Garcia, Duratio, I'm not quite sure how to say your name. Happy to say it if you want to type it out um, pronunciation-wise. There already is a video on bending. It is the second most watched video on this channel. It's a, and if you do a lesson with me, uh, which I know we've talked a little bit about via email, I'm just probably going to point you to the video. <laughs> because everything was already said there. And anybody, by the way, who wants to come and do lessons uh, with me, um, I will give you homework. And homework will involve watching my videos. And it's not because I am, you know, uh, an egotistical person. It's because what needs to be said has already been said. And the reason I don't tend to do a lot of lessons and lessons and lessons and I build my right life around teaching lessons and you know I, I do guitar lessons please do guitar lessons with me is number one because I have a marketing business and I make plenty of money doing that and I love guitar and I love sharing um, this guitar stuff um, and I don't need the money from lessons and I make like twice as much three times as much on a business consult than I do a guitar consult and so it doesn't make sense financially for me to just promo a bunch of lessons. It doesn't fill my time in a good way. Um, that said, lessons are all, teaching lessons is also very important for me because um, it keeps me sharp as a teacher. Um, me knowing what I know in my background is different than the experience that everybody else has had with their upbringing playing guitar. Um, and I try to write to that in my videos. And the way in which I accomplish that is by watching a ton of other lesson videos before I write my scripts. So that when I write my scripts, I can, throughout the video, address, here's why not to do it this way. Here's why not to do it this way. Here's why not to do it this way. And then also give you, you know, my case for the way that I do it, which I laid out so much of that. <laughs> so much of that here tonight. Um, And uh, Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Lewis, uh, I think I speak for everyone here. You should make a video on each guitar technique since no one explains it so well. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And that's, that's been my goal the whole time. Um, yeah. Um, so for right now, uh, yeah, I'm working on the, the Darkness Machine solo and working on a little bit of Dance of Eternity. It's mind-numbing. And um, been working on this dying soul, which is a beast. But to uh, to sum it all up, um, my approach with picking technique and who I am and why I'm doing it this way, uh, I come from a very highly trained classical music background. I went to University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, where I trained on French horn. I also have a lot of classical uh, training on string bass, which I did. Uh, six to tenth grade and started with lessons and that's where I built my left hand a lot of my left hand technique already 
Um, so I basically have 20 years of, of left-hand technique. I have very little time on right-hand technique, yet the clips that I'm showing, not necessarily in the videos because I acknowledge that I'm still developing as a player, um, which is why I did the recent clips on Instagram and tried to demo some stuff for you guys tonight, um, is I, I have a technique that is developing in, uh, I believe, a superior way uh, physiologically as confirmed by massage therapists, chiropractors, as well as my one-on-one -on -one teachers versus people who have been playing 20 years, been playing 40 years. Time does not equal expertise. Um, and the wrist has six motions, rotation. If you use that for picking, it will take the pick away and then back in and then away and then back in, so it's inefficient. Uh, and then flexion and extension, which is uh, the string hopping method, which you don't want to do. Troy Grady went over that in his videos. Um, and then we have adduction, abduction, which the most efficient picking motion you could possibly make is simply from one side of the string to the other. And that is the motion that aligns with that. We use pronation and supination, like I talk about in my sweeping videos, in order to do string selection. And then that allows us to use adduction and abduction the entire time that we're doing that. And then when we want to move the whole arm, we can use extension at the elbow is where I think about it. So I hope that sums up all the technique and stuff. And I hope you guys really enjoyed this. Um, if you want to send me a message, you can do it on Instagram. And I think this slide was really important, so maybe I'll get someone to do some timestamps for it. And I'm going to drop a link to my, info, my Instagram profile. So if you have additional questions, you can ask there. Send me videos of you guys playing. And uh, thanks so much. I'm going to go practice. Peace.